If you're in a situation where you're providing services, you're trading for a limited company, then it's quite possible that you will be subject to new regulations that kick in in April 2021. Hi folks, my name's Mahmood. I'm an accountant in practice that has been going for about 26 years. Um, I've worked in the field of business, education, internationally, nationally for about 35, 40 years now. Uh, my current mission is to help businesses, online businesses, any businesses to improve their money mindset, make profit, make time. And I do that through a number of mechanisms. And one of them is the weekly broadcast that we're doing here. And today's topic is that wonderful, exciting thing about what's called personal service companies. Now, what is this I hear you say? Now, you may have heard a number of acronyms floating around in terms of like off payroll working. You may have uh, called it disguised remuneration, which is a very strange bit of terminology that HMRC tend to use. Um, it's commonly known as IR35. And in this broadcast today, I'm going to go through what it actually means in practical terms uh, from the 1st of April 2021. You may find that you've got some notifications. You've already been preparing for the changes that are going to be upon us in a couple of weeks' time. If you're not, let me make you aware of what the changes are, what you can and cannot do, and what you should do next. And we'll, we'll talk some numbers as well. It wouldn't be a, a number show unless we had some figures to introduce as well. So uh, good morning here. So Jess, good morning to you. Hope you are well. Hope you keep you well in the world of numbers and tax. Now, fundamentally, as we go through this, guys, as you catch up, if you want to sort of um, add any questions, um, just fire them away. I'll do my best to answer them as we go through the broadcast. If you're catching this up on replay, then obviously put the hashtag replay in there. I'll be able to pick up your comments. I know you're out there, and I'll be able to respond to them accordingly. Now, we've got some just slides just to give you a focus on what we want to talk about. There's so much more we can talk about on R35, uh, which is probably the more commonly term it's actually called. And what I will certainly see as we go through this uh, presentation is that it's not the death knell for all companies. There is still a very good positive reason to actually trade for a limited company. You might want to check out the new section on our website, uh, the blogs that we've done previously where we've talked about the merits of trading through a limited company. The focus is really about what's called PSCs, which is an acronym for personal service companies. So by the power of magic, let's have a look at what we're going to cover in this session. So if this works, which it should do, bang, there we go. So we're commonly going to refer to it as IR35. That's not the official term that HMRC will use to describe this legislation. R35 is come up to its 21st anniversary, introduced back in April 20 or April 2000 to deal with what was called uh, avoidance. The language that HMRC and the commentators use to describe this, by the way, is this assumption that we've got millions of people up and down the UK, you know, avoiding their tax by you know trading through limited companies and therefore the tax take to the exchequer has dropped dramatically. The objective, I'll say the objective, not necessarily the practice, is to harmonize the treatment and basically say, if you are trading through a limited company, actually if we take that bit away and actually look at your relationship with your client, is it in reality one of employee, employer, a worker relationship? Or are you actually genuinely self-employed? And that question has really dominated the thoughts by the comments for about the last 150, 200 years. So there's nothing new that's radical in the changes as such. Status test has always been something that organizations and clients and businesses need to take care of. It's just that we've got a change of emphasis in how these rules are actually applied. So the, there are some changes, by the way, between... Uh, pre-April 21 and post-April 21, but let's just say fundamentally the essence of IR35 stays the same. It's the application of the rules that there is some changes. And basically, if you're a freelancer or a contractor that operates for a limited company, it's going to affect you fundamentally. And there's a pragmatic view that's going to be taken by employment agencies, recruitment agencies and clients. Uh, and therefore, that's going to be quite an interesting dynamic to look at. 
So what are we, what are we going to look at as far as today is concerned? There we go. Isn't that pretty, everybody? Um, all the design aesthetics, by the way, I'll take full responsibility for. Um, I hope you like the new layout of the slide. Um, again, just some reference points there for you to have a look at later on. Uh, we do a weekly podcast uh, or called I Hate Numbers. It's gone past its year anniversary. Uh, the I would thoroughly recommend, have a check it out, look at it there. It's a short 10, 15 minute podcast covering a wide variety of business issues that affect your business, tax and the like. We've got a weekly news and video section here. So where we can, we've got lots of lovely information for you guys to tap into. So what are we going to cover in this session? So I'm going to give you an overview. I've really intimated to some extent what we're talking about, but let's just clarify what this is all about. There's an overview about what IR35 actually is. In essence, we're going to be talking about how it's applied, what's actually going to change post-April the 1st, 2021. And I will also point out, by the way, the change that's coming on April 21 has was actually deferred. It was meant to come in April 2020. So therefore, COVID intervened and it's coming out now. And there are no signs at the moment that it's likely to be deferred or rolled out. Certainly no references in the Chancellor's budget on changes to off-payroll working. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, it's here and it's coming very soon. We'll look at the process. So what does it actually mean? So with this new rule changes, it changes responsibilities. So who's responsible for doing what? What's the process? Um, I'm going to refer you to a tool that, I've, that a number of agencies are recommending, suggesting, pressuring their freelancers to actually use to determine what's called status. And I'm going to give you some screenshots at the end to show what the end result will look like. There's three possible outcomes. Um, in a good old typical Blue Peter fashion, I tried one, tried it earlier myself, put myself through the paces, doing a number of changes in the questions that could be asked and the answers, and we'll see what the results are. Okay, tax. This is fundamentally about tax. Uh, the headlines are, it's about harmonising the treatment, making, the, making it consistent between employees and those people who operate through a company, providing their services through that and to make sure the treatments are the same. It's a bit inconsistent by that and unfair, in my opinion, in the one sense that wanting to treat the, the tax and the payroll on similar footings, but it actually doesn't give the freelancer or you in your business any additional rights here so even though you might be taxed the same you don't actually get any benefits to go with that and that's for me a massive inequity and then the options that you've got and like in all things in life there are always options that you have um, some of them might be very painful uh, but there are options nevertheless in terms of what one can do going forward now, what I'm going to do, actually, let's go on to the next slide. And I'm going to just bow out the screen, um, just for a moment, and let's have the full slide in its full technicolor. You'll still hear my wonderful dog dulcet tones coming through. I might play around with this. Let's see what we've got coming up here. And if I can get this mouse to click, just bear with me for a minute. There we go. Now, fundamentally, what we've got here is that the IR35, and I'll give it its working title, is effectively about where you as an individual, so whether you call yourself a freelancer, whether you call yourself a contractor, subcontractor, but you as an individual provide personal services, and obviously I don't mean that in the adult context, provide your services via what's called an intermediary. An intermediary, by the way, typically covers partnerships and companies, so for our purposes here, the, in my experience of dealing with clients of this here, is where you as an individual provide services via a company, typically, it's called a personal service company, to an end client. So for example, if you're a, a trainer, you work in IT, the typical model would be that somebody engages your service, they want your expertise, you'll be trading through a company, so it might be Mahmood Reza Limited, provides the services of that individual to the end client. Now, if you tick the box on all four of those, 
it applies. Now, let's also talk about the exceptions. So if you are self-employed, i.e. you don't have a company or a called a sole trader, and you provide services to a client, then the IR35 rules do not cover that situation. Secondly, let's have a, a bit of a revisit about this whole thing about an intermediary. So let's get the screen back on here. If I'm a business and I provide services, so we're not talking about products here, providing services, what's going on between my ears, my intellectual property, my intelligence, my knowledge, my skills, call them what you wish. Now, when I set up my business, I typically have two main choices. I can either operate as a sole trader, an individual, or I can operate as a limited company. Now, once you create that limited company vehicle, then in legal terms and in tax terms, you create two separate identities. And that's going back to case law, going back to 1872, Salomon and Salomon as it's referred to, just to drop that in there. So you create that separate legal personality. So if Mahmood here was called upon and they wanted my services to, you know, whether it is whatever field that was, I could have a choice of saying, me, Mahmood Reza, the individual, will invoice you accordingly. Or actually what I'm going to do is to create a company, call it something really original, I, I Hate Numbers Limited, and that legal beast provides the services to you via that medium. Now, you may think, well, actually, Mahmood, that's pretty much they're the same thing, but a legal company is a separate legal person, capable of issuing contracts, capable of separate identity, and therefore you create what's called largely a worker relationship and a company relationship. So that's what we mean. So you've got a company that invoices your own client effectively, providing your services, then IR35 is likely to apply to you. Now remember, it's likely to apply, but again, whether it does or not will depend on a number of variables. So basically, sole traders, it uh, doesn't apply to you. Limited companies, personal service companies, it will do. If you're a manufacturer, if you're a retailer, if you're selling product, and that's what you're selling on, IR35 has nothing to do with that. Okay, let's continue. Now, first of all, where does it apply? Now, fundamentally, by the way, here's the major change that's going to happen between up to the, uh, effectively, April 21 and post April 21. Now, the decision about as to whether IR35 applies and if it does, what happens next is either going to be the responsibility of the end client or it's going to be you. So that assessment as to what you actually are which then determines the tax treatment, is basically do you, as the owner of that company, or your client, take that decision? And that decision, by the way, will fundamentally affect how much tax is taken off, who pays it over to HMRC, and who takes all the responsibilities. Now, this is something that's been brought in line, by the way, with the public sector. So back in 2017, when the rules changed were modified for the public sector. I remember writing about this in Arts Professional back in 2017 and our own website. Effectively, what would happen, as you can see there, it's when you work, provide services to the public sector, so that could be a charity, a local authority, then what would happen is, it is the responsibility of that public sector entity to make that decision as to your actual status. When it says status, by the way, We'll explore that on the next slide. It's about what are you in reality? What's the relationship between your client and you if you strip away the corporate veil? So if you didn't have a company there at all, what's the reality of the relationship between the two of you? And that's the fundamental driving point behind how this legislation is going to be applied. Now, for the last few years, public sector bodies have been doing this. And I had to do that from 6th of April, 2017. Now, from the 6th of April, 2021, it's now going to be the responsibility of a large or medium-sized company in the private sector who will make that decision. And remember, the decision, first of all, is are you caught by IR35 rules? If the answer is yes, then it's going to mean that when you invoice your client, Effectively, when they pay you on that invoice, 
a larger slice of money is going to be taken away from that. If IR35 does not apply to you, when you present the invoice to your end client, they will pay that invoice in full, and the responsibility for what happens to that money falls onto your shoulders. So it's about who makes the decision. It's either the end client or you. Now, if your end client is classified as a small private sector client, typically a company that's got private shareholding, then effectively it's your responsibility to make that decision. Now, you might be thinking quite naturally, what is a small company? A small company is defined as a company that's got an annual turnover of less than 10.4 million, less than 50 people it's employing, and a balance sheet total of no more than 5 million. If it satisfies any two of those conditions, you're classified as a small client. So if I Hate Numbers Limited was invoicing a company in the private sector, and that company was small as per that decision, then it's for me to decide, my company to decide, what is my status, what is my relationship. If it's a large company that I'm providing my services to, it's that client that makes that choice. A bit of pragmatism here, everybody. We talked about the end client. In reality, if you are a large end user, and let's take the example of the IT industry. Now, the IT industry is very well known because the vast majority, I would say about 99.999% of individuals who supply IT services, whether that's from web building, whether that's from data analytics, you know, anything in that IT sector, those services are typically provided through a limited company. What you will find is that most clients and clients will not actually take on your services unless you trade either through a limited company or what they call an umbrella company, which I'm going to refer to at the end of this broadcast. Now, the reason they do that historically is because if you pay a company, then actually the responsibility for what are they, are they employees, are they self-employed, largely has nothing to do with you. So you don't have to worry about all that administration, you don't have to worry about all that assessment, you know, that is down for your engaging company. This actually started back in the uh, 1972, by the way, in the construction industry, where historically, that when you were working in the construction industry, uh, when you invoiced your client for your subcontracting work, your labouring, your plastering, your electrical work, your employer would pay you in full. Rules were introduced that then said, actually, employers, people who engage those subcontractors, we want you to take money off sort at source of those individuals, unless they're companies. And there's a massive rush then for lots of bricklayers, electricians, plasterers and the like to form limited companies there. So that's our sort of historical legacy. Now let's fast forward back to where we are at the moment. So, remember, it's the responsibility for making the assessment that changes, not the fundamental rules. There are some nuances of changes, by the way, which I'm going to mention in the next couple of slides. But fundamentally, if it's a small client you're providing services to, and you're providing those services for a limited company, then you effectively are making that decision whether IR35 applies. We will see what the conclusion is, by the way, that if IR35, <coughs> pardon me, does apply, then there are a number of things that one has to do when you actually process that invoice and make that payment accordingly. Let's talk about more about process. Now, let's assume we are in a situation that we are providing our services, whether they're IT, doesn't matter what those services are, through the medium of a limited company, and the end client is classified as not small, so i.e. they've got typically a turnover in excess of 10.4 million, they've got over 50 employees, and these are employees directly from them, then your client will be making that status decision. And status doesn't mean are you a good person or you're a bad person. It means, in reality, is the relationship one of worker and effectively engager? Do we have an employment relationship that actually goes on? The practical thing is, by the way, the decisions by the end client will normally, normally be actually delegated to 
a recruitment agency, an agency that finds that pool of talent to provide to the end client. So if we imagine things like banks, if we imagine things like large companies, they may not actually want to take somebody on their own books as an employee. They might want to get additional services outside so they're not on the books. They don't have to worry about holiday pay. They don't have to worry about employment contracts. They don't have to worry about making pension provisions. They don't have to worry uh, about providing benefits. All the things that go, go positively and negatively with the taking on an, a, an employee, that is not met when you're actually going to recruitment agencies. All that responsibility largely rests with the recruitment agency. So what will happen is it's the recruitment agencies that typically find the talent, administer all the paperwork, the timesheets, the actual paying of the invoices that will be making that decision with the you as the provider. The legislation outlines that says you should be doing it on an individual basis. The reality would be, again, based on client feedback, based on what I've read, the forums and all the rest of it, is if we can think an agency that might be dealing with several hundred people on their books having to make these status tests, what they're generally speaking doing is making, when I say a blanket decision, they will be using an HMRC tool. They will not be looking at each individual circumstance uh, because it's just going to be very difficult for them, administratively making that judgment. And status, by the way, despite what some people think, is not just going through a checklist and saying, tick, 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 this applies. Status, self-employed relationship is an overall balance, looking at a number of variables, and it's quite a sophisticated technique. There is no legal definition at the moment as to what self-employed actually means. We know it as a working title. We know it by something called badges of trade that have developed but there is no statutory definition at the moment for what constitutes self-employment. In previous broadcasts, we've talked about things like Uber, we've talked about status, and that, this is not going away, by the way. And at the moment, the government is still working on it, pressure groups are coming in, but for the time being, we don't have a legal definition. So we're going to look at it as an overall number of factors. Now, if your end client via the recruitment agency typically makes the decision that your contract is within IR35, then when you may provide the invoice to them, out of that will come a bigger slice of money for tax, and they will make what's called a deemed employment payment. Now, typical HMRC fashion and government legislation, there's IR35 where you make the decision where the uh, that deemed payment phrase comes in it is being changed and it's the same terminology but effectively they will be the ones who take that money off they will effectively treat your money they're paying to you as wages subject that to a PAYE and then pay that over to HMRC now let's have a look at the status as I said status is not actually legally defined as self-employment the conclusion being that if you are genuinely self-employed then fine, you know, the, your client pays your invoice in full, end of story, everyone's happy. And you've got obviously much more powerful things you can do for tax planning. What we tend to look for is what's called case law. So we look at of a number of variables. I'll flag some of these up to you now. So, for example, how much control you have over the nature of the work that you're doing, how it's carried out, how you're remunerated. You know, are you paid by the hour? Are you paid per project? Are you able to substitute, send substitutes in? So if you're unable to turn up, can you send a substitute to carry out that work? Things like what business structure do you actually have? Fundamentally, it's a question of risk. So if you're self-employed, the argument, the old argument used to be that you take on board a level of financial risk, you take on board a level of business risk, and if in reality you're doing exactly what an employee would be doing by the level of risk that you're taking, if things go wrong, you get paid to put them right. If you're self-employed, if you do a job of work for a client, typically you'll be charging a client for a fee for that project. You may have a team of people working with you. You may not actually do all of the work. You may delegate those tasks internally. And their status is actually represents that. It says, are you effectively a worker? So is that a contract of service or are you self-employed and therefore it becomes a contract for services? 
The default tool, by the way, is called an employment status tool that's published by HMRC, which tends to or tries to reflect some of these elements that we've talked about. It is flawed. And I'm going to show you three outcomes that the tool gives you. However, having said that, it is a tool, it is a resource that a large number of recruitment agencies and end clients will be using. Uh, HMRC that say, actually, as long as your answers are honestly and truthfully given, once you put those series of questions in there, there's about 20 plus questions in there to answer. And it will spew out one of three outcomes. It will say, yep, it doesn't apply to you. Yes, it applies to you. Or more often than not, it will say, we're unable to make that determination. So CEST is an online tool that's used to, to help determine your employment status. Or you. Now, what I would say is anybody who's worked in the area of law, um, I did my first degree in law, will know that when it comes to making an assessment, it's a very complex situation. There are certainly major criteria that we can take on board to determine somebody's relationship, their status, but it's not really just a checklist here. You know, what weighting do you give? So we're trying to redact a very complex situation into a, a series of questions as well. Having said that, that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Calculation. Now, let's assume we go through this situation and you, uh, it's determined that IR35 applies to you. Then what will happen is, here's the calculation. Now, the calculation that your end client performs if you're providing services to a medium or large company differs slightly than if you're providing services to a small company where you would make those calculations yourself. So it's assumed your IR35 court. Effectively, the, the money that relates to that IR35 payment, we're going to focus, first of all, on what your end client does from the 6th of April 2021 onwards. And what they do is follows. So you've agreed a rate or your agency has agreed a rate with you. Now, what they're saying is that that rate will include an amount for employees national insurance and include an amount for the apprentice levy typically now what this means automatically that if you agreed a rate with your agency before the new rules kick in it's likely there'll be pressure and those rates will reduce because your agency brackets end client will take out of that a slice that relates to employers national insurance crudely speaking and it's a crude number if you've got a pre 6 of April rate of say 400 quid, it's likely your rate's going to be dropped by 12 and a half percent. So you're going to get about 350 quid. And the reason for that is that 50 quid that you lose out on represents the employer's contribution that your agency will have to take off that payment. They're not obviously going to have their profits eroding too dramatically. So there will be definitely, and I've seen that, a reduction of rates. So out of that fee comes the employer's national insurance and like the apprentice levy. They will be able to take off expenses, typically that you as an employee would, uh, would be allowed to have deducted against your salary. So things like any materials you provided to your, your client, they can take those off, that's a deductible expense. Uh, travel, by the way, incurred in normal commuting is not allowed. It's not allowed for employees who are employed in the conventional sense. So the vast majority of expenses that you would expect or you may hope that you can claim would not be allowable. So typically travel and uh, uh, would be a disallowed expense. So I've got a, a pre-6 of April rate of 400 quid, 50 quid I've lost. So let's say my agreed daily rate is 350. Out of that, let's assume I have got no expenses I can claim. Commuting travel costs will not be counted then that will be subject to normal PAYE rules, i.e. the your agency will deduct income tax for the PAYE contributions and also deduct the employee's national insurance as well. So even though it might not be called a salary, it's going to be treated like it was so. A couple of practical housekeeping tips here, by the way. If you have a company, which obviously you will do if this applies, then remember your tax code, your employment contract will be with your main company. 
if you're providing services to an agency net via an agency now, then you need to make sure you get your tax code transferred across. Otherwise, the money that you receive will be subject to what's called basic rate tax. The assumptions will be made that this is your second employment. So it gets a bit messy. Make sure you've got that sorted out with your employee or through your agency. Now, what's the impact? Well, the reality is will be uh, the rates that you may have charged pre 6th of April will drop. Obviously, if you've got something very specialised, if you're the only one providing those services, then it's very likely your rates will stay the same. My instinct says your rates will drop. Um, I think the reality also will be that a number of agencies, a number of uh, companies will be looking overseas to recruit more uh, services. Uh, understandably, when it comes to anything of a tax nature, engagers, agencies and the like will be looking to reduce the amount they have to pay over. As a roughly snapshot figure, when I've done the evaluations, there's a plus and minus. So if you are caught under IR35, then what that means is effectively most of the money that you earn will be subject to a calculation. What that means in reality, by the way, also is that your company, because it will still be income to your company, will not pay corporation tax. You've already paid the tax at source, so there's no additional tax for you to pay. However, on a comparative basis, crudely speaking, overall, you'll be paying about 20 to 23% plus more tax overall. So it will be costly, and obviously your take-home as such will be squeezed down. Now, here's the, to te uh, the tool I was referring to earlier on. This is the CES tool, which a large number of agencies are uh, asking their workers to provide. Now, I've got three results here. So I went through a series of putting in theoretical questions, thinking, right, these apply to me. And the, the best conclusion you can go for is this one. Off pay payroll working rules, uh, well, that's the worst one, I suppose, apply. So what that means, typically, by me answering the questions, it suggests that, you know, I can't substitute. I get paid for each hour I work. I've got no real control of what I do. Uh, I've got no business structure. I don't take any risks. I'm not paid for any costs. So effectively, I'm turning up, doing the work, going home. Um, other factors like if I've previously worked for that end client before, the client says, I don't need you anymore, but actually provide your services for a company, then the off payroll working rules apply. There is some logic and common sense here, by the way. So you know, to, to be fair to the application of these rules, and remember, these rules haven't changed. It's about the application of the rules that's here. And the reality has always been that if you're not really self-employed, then the, the argument would go, you know, why should you uh, benefit from all the tax breaks? Now, that's an ongoing conversation, perhaps for another broadcast day. But effectively, this is saying we actually think you're a worker. We don't think there's any indication that you're self-employed genuinely, no risks, therefore it applies and it will apply. The middle one, so it, you know, this is a bit of AI, a bit of a, well, I wouldn't actually call it that intelligent. Uh, remember that the CES tool is flawed, but it's still used very widely. And this is saying, actually, it's not quite clear what you are. So basically, it gives you a contact number, you can speak further, talk to somebody else, but somebody will have to make that determination. If you're working for a large uh, company, by the way, a large end client, it's unlikely, unless you've got a specialist skill that nobody else has, they're going to be spending a lot of time and energy for you doing this. Uh, you do have the right of appeal, by the way, against any incorrect determination, whether that's actually going to filter through, whether the agency is going to want to do that or not, is a different consideration. Obviously, your best conclusion. So I'm, I played around with this, putting a number of factors in there. Uh, effectively, I put in some variables suggesting that I actually take a number of risks. I've got a proper business structure behind me. I'm paying out for things that the client uh, will not pay me initially. Uh, this doesn't cover things like commuting costs, accommodation costs, etc. So effectively, what it's saying is actually, removed. we've taken our decision, our conclusion is based on what you've told us. As long as it's all fair and decent and honest, 
that actually they don't apply. So I invoice my client. I show them a copy of this, obviously. Uh, that determines my status. If they're happy with that, that keeps it on file. And when I invoice the agency, I take the money in full and there's nothing to worry about. I want to say nothing to worry about. What that means is IR35 doesn't apply. And therefore, I've got a wonderful opportunity to engage in lots of positive tax planning strategies to extract the maximum benefit out of my company. If you want to check out some previous news and broadcasts, by the way, where we've actually explored that and actually looked at the tax status here. So please don't interpret this as the death knell for companies. I certainly think it's going to be interesting when it comes to personal service companies as to what we do with them. Let's just go back one more slide. In conclusion, what do you think is going to go on? Well, I think largely a number of people that I'm seeing operating as through personal service companies will stop trading because the logic is they're all going to what they call umbrella companies. And I suppose as a, I'm just going to go back a slide here. We talked about options, umbrella companies. I didn't really talk too much about umbrellas, but I am going to now. Um, if you are caught by the AR35 rules, if your end client is the one who's going to take off the money, a large number of people apply their services through what's called now an umbrella company. Now, an umbrella company is an is, is a like the middle person. So you've got the end client, who could be a bank, could be a software house, it could be you know whatever they do, a manufacturing company that needs some services. You provide your services. The mid person, the umbrella company, is basically somebody who does all the administration operates a payroll, you're actually on their books, uh, they will do the timesheets, they will take take your invoice, and they are working on behalf typically of the recruitment agency that's got you. The recruitment agency may not have the infrastructure to, to manage a payroll, so it goes to an umbrella company. Now, a word of warning. Many umbrella companies are making very false promises about, you know, come with us and we can guarantee you, you know, a massive amount of take-home pay, Remember, many of these umbrella companies are a sham in the sense that it has to be subject to normal employment rules. There is a limit on what you can claim as legitimate expenses. Uh, there's been a number of schemes going out. And if it all goes wrong, by the way, and the umbrella company folds, HMRC will come after you. So just treat it with a bit, bit of caution. What an umbrella company can compete on, though, is the quality of the service and the fee they're charging. If they're promising you the you know the golden goose, the golden egg, for if you go onto their books, um, you know I would just treat it with a word of caution. Well, folks, that's uh, let's get to the end. So, hope you found this useful. Check it out. I know it can be quite depressing. Uh, the rules are here; they're going to go. Remember that the, the idea is though, even if you provide your services for a small client. The responsibility for checking out IR35 is on your shoulders. There's a slight difference, by the way, in how you do the calculation. It's a bit more generous. If you're doing it yourself, you're allowed like a 5% deduction uh, as a general sort of deduction against the money you're invoicing. But largely, they're one of the same. I think there's going to be more in this space as time goes on in terms of determining status. HMRC are under a pressure point to collect more money into the exchequer. Language is going to get quite a bit messy. Check out the news. Check out the broadcast on the uh, podcast. Uh, tomorrow's podcast, by the way, is a new piece of legislation that was in there since 6th of April 2020. That's going to be on Monday's uh, video broadcast. And uh, tomorrow, I Hate Numbers, is going to be a synopsis on the budget. So listen, folks, that's enough from me. Hopefully, I haven't depressed you too much. Um, and remember, the changes are coming. Get prepared for them. And good luck. And I'll see you guys on the other side next week.